Wonderful, we'll give it maybe another couple seconds, just let people trickle in. But in the meantime, please go ahead, introduce yourself in the chat, say where you're calling in from, uh, if you are a founder, what your company is. Love to see who's here. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and kick it off. Well, welcome to Graham and Walker's Where Do We Play? Go to Market Strategy Workshop with Ben Wild from Georgian. Thank you for joining us. Um, I know that this has been a hard day for many of us. So I just want to acknowledge that and say that we really appreciate you being here. Um, my name is Jenna Winokur. I'm Operations and Events Manager here at Graham and Walker. I use she, her pronouns. And if this is the first time you are joining us, Graham and Walker is a venture firm that activates the potential of women in business through programs, community, and direct investment. We are on a mission to reshape the public markets by investing in technology companies that are led by women and non-binary founders. Part of that programming includes sessions like today where we bring in amazing people like Ben Wild from Georgian. Ben is Georgian's head of marketing and growth and in this role, Ben is responsible for the firm's outbound investment pipeline, market research, and all aspects of Georgian's marketing. Ben has over 20 years of experience in the software industry, including senior product management and strategy roles at IBM, Informix Software, and a range of early and growth stage startups. Thank you for being here with us, Ben. And before I pass it over to you, uh, I just wanna say if anyone here has not received the workbook prior to this session, please DM me and I'll be sure to get that over to you. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Ben. Thanks, Jeez. Jenna. Awesome. Um, lovely to see everyone here today. Thanks for joining and um, condolences on the uh, horrible tragedy in, in Texas. So um, special thoughts to someone's joining from Austin. So special and Houston I see as well. So thoughts go out to you, um, really tough day. So. Thanks for joining. Uh, so this is actually a primarily an interactive session. So that's why the, um, there's not a lot of slides. I'll put those up in a second. Uh, but just, uh, I guess, a tiny bit more on me. Uh, thanks for the quick intro there. But my background is predominantly in product management um, prior to joining Georgian. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time in the software world, mostly on database software, did a bit of technical consulting and um, systems admin and programming and stuff in the past as well but the last uh, I guess 14 years now I've been with Georgian uh, and working with um, the team there we grew from five to um, to 100 uh, I've got one of my staff Connor on today I've got a former staff member Katie uh, on who joined us for a few years but broke my heart when she left um, but doing cool things uh, cool different things now but we've, we've been through a journey of um, being a startup ourselves and going from um, being a very small growth equity firm that had a $50 million fund and there was just five of us to um, there's almost a hundred of us now and we sometimes write $50 million checks. So that was kind of a weird thing to go from, um, you know, that, that day when that happened, that was, uh, um, was interesting. But so we've been through some of, the things ourselves, but more importantly, we've worked with a lot of companies over the years. We typically are involved with companies that are a later stage than you, um, that you'll all be at. But what we've done in the last couple of years is launched a program called our CoLab. And what we do there, and Connor, who's on the call, is um, responsible for that. What we do is we, we decided that we wanted to um, get involved with companies earlier and um and help them get from the early stage to the series b where we typically we play um, ourselves and so this material that i'm going through today and the session that connor's going to do in i think next month uh is is based on that um on that program and so we run we run companies through this all the time and in, in particular one of the reasons we've been working with um graham and walker is that uh and other partners as well is we've recognized that there just aren't enough um, diverse founders making it through to the growth stage. And so we can't just sit on our backsides and wait for that to happen. We have to go earlier and help more founders get to that stage. And so that's that's why we um, support um, partners like um, GNW and uh, get excited about meeting founders like yourselves. So today is, um, 
it's not a unique discussion in terms of this idea of finding focus, which is really what the whole session is about. So probably many of the advisors that you've spoken with will speak with, especially VCs are fond of, you know, talking about, you know, you've got to be focused and blah, blah, blah. But oftentimes the conversation doesn't necessarily go beyond that. And you may even think that you're focused um, on the surface of it and you might be. But the reality is, especially when you're undercapitalized and statistically speaking, every founder on this call will be undercapitalized relative to her uh, peers <laughs> because the unfortunately the data shows that, that um, female and uh, diverse founders are underrepresented in the VC numbers. So that means that you're all probably doing, um, pursuing a, to some extent, an AFM strategy, anything for money. And it's a necessary thing as you're um, getting started, but what it results in is it results in you having potentially a lot of different constituents in your product or your offering. And so part of what this exercise is about is taking a bit of a step back and saying, look, before we think about go to market, and um, and I did get Jenna to ask some questions and the, I saw the questions that came through, well, I think when you were registering and there was quite a diverse set of go to the market questions. And a lot of them were very specific to uh, like literally in market, what do I do? The point of this exercise today is to, is to take a step back and say, okay, but what's the offering first? And this is how we always approach it with our companies. Uh, it's like, what's the actual offering and who's really who are we addressing with those features and that function and then are we are we a little bit too scattered like do we need to do we need to peer back in some areas and then that helps shape that go to market because if you don't take that product driven approach then it's very difficult to put together the right set of go to market strategies so that's in terms of the setup that's really where where we're coming from um so what we're going to do is i'm just going to go through a couple of things uh just talk a little bit but then what I'd like you to do is, um, if you haven't already, is actually do the workbook and fill it out. Um, I'll give you some time in the session to do that. Uh, I don't know, Jen, if you've got any music. I should have asked that. We could play some music. I could find some music to play. Yeah. Uh, chill out. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe five minutes at a time. Uh, and, and then we can talk about it. Now, I've also, what I've done is I've booked three days next week, like three hours and uh, on each day, something like that. And, to, and I've said to Jenna, she can book anyone. So if you email Jenna after the session, just grab a slot. It's all later in the day Eastern. So I'm actually calling you from New Zealand uh, today. So um, it's easier for me to talk to people in uh, Pacific. So if you're in the Pacific zone, if you could ask for a slightly later time, that would be great. And then the, maybe we can accommodate the Eastern time zone people a little earlier. But I'm happy to spend uh, 30 minutes uh, next week with any of you um, we'll just try and make it work uh, to to go through this or to answer any other questions that you've got as well uh, and um, if you prefer we can also do it via email I'm happy to do that as well so without that any further ado let me just pull up my my slides here does anyone have any questions at this stage you can just pop as we go just pop all your questions uh, in the chat and um, Jenna and team are going to uh, I'm just looking at how the numbers are going here. Uh, Jenna and T will be able to queue those up for me and um, um, I can uh, address them as we go. That's fine, we can do that. Okay, so I'm gonna share this. All right. Um, where's my full screen? Uh, why am I not seeing this? All right, and so unused, I'm just gonna do it like this. I'm so unused to using uh, PDFs these days. Okay, so did everyone have a chance to look through the workbook beforehand? So the show of hands was that, and did did a few folks have a chance to read the post? Uh, for, that was a it's a bit of an interview. If you haven't read it, it's with our um, head of sales, basically uh, Joe, and Joe's been in the the selling enterprise software at least business. Uh, for a long time and I should qualify that so a lot of you I think uh, across probably maybe two-thirds of you are more in the, the business small business software space and the other thirds maybe slightly more in the um, consumer or um, you know not quite b2b software space 
So that's a lot of what I'm talking about is based on a B2B focus and experience, but um, hopefully a, um, a fair bit of it is applicable. And that's true for Joe as well, but there's a lot of good thinking in there. And he really just goes through the uh, this strategy consulting um, framework that we've got, which, you know, where do we play is at the top of that. And as, as I said already, this is really about zooming out and trying to address before you worry about feet on the street, really, you know, go back and look at the offering again. Um, and uh, this is just a, a simple, simple framework for doing that. So really the question is, is like, what are you actually building? And it says product here, but if you have a service offering, it's the same, it's the same principle. You've got some sort of audience, uh, you've probably got multiple users, your economic buyer might be different from your user. Um, and it's really important to map it out and see if you can answer these three questions. So, you know, we're starting today with what product are we building? Um, and then you can move forward and think about, um, we'll, we'll look at what markets you're selling to. And then um, is the way that you're actually selling it fitting with the market? Um, and maybe that's part of the innovation that you're doing is to find a different way to sell um, something in, a, in an existing market. But these are the three things, starting with this product-led thinking, which is all very much on, on fashion these days anyway. So um, it's a good place to start. So it's very product oriented. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm a little bit repetitive here, but does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, so let's, let's what, what I think we should do now is, is dive into it. So um, to start with, jot down some notes if you haven't already. It's like, if you can, um, and if someone's already done this, um, put up your hand and we'll get you to talk through it. But really go back to fundamentals. So um, what does the product do? What is the actual value that you get? And then how does those, how do those product features, how does that product strategy influence how you go about finding customers? And even though it seems basic, we get companies that are doing six, 10, $15 million in recurring revenue that can't always answer these questions succinctly and off the cuff. So if you, if you either think that this is too simple, then I can assure you that it's not. And then on the other side, if you can't do it, then don't worry because there's plenty of bigger organizations that haven't nailed this. So does, any, does anyone feel um, brave enough to, to want to chat about this? And we, you can just jump off mute and um, talk us through it. I'm Someone happy might... to go if no one else is. Sorry, I can't. Jenna, you go, you go, sure you, go you got it. Oh, you sure? <laughs> Hi, Ben, I'm Ildi. I'm the CEO of Orbit Learning Company. Um, we are, as everyone on, I think on the call in early stage, um, we're a B2B SaaS product that's selling to K-12 public schools in the US. And we are creating a learning experience platform for teachers to help develop them as professionals uh, with the goal of uh, increasing teacher retention. Right. So your customer is the school district? Yes. Yeah, so we're selling to school districts, uh, principals, uh, and superintendents, and our end user client is a teacher. Okay. And so um, the product is a learning experience program. Yes, it's a platform. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the value to the customer is actually retention of teachers. So the value to the customer is uh, teacher development across the continuum of their career. So from brand new teacher all the way through to administrator and then uh, teacher retention, which the ultimate goal in K-12 is improving student outcomes. Yeah, cool. So you've got basically already, I mean, this is not a, I'm not saying this is a, this is not a negative, this is a, positive you've already identified you've got basically two two audiences right so you've got mm -hmm. the teachers who are functionally using the product on a day-to-day -day basis and getting you know being happier about their jobs for using it and improving student outcomes and all that sort of stuff but then you've got very much the um the economic buyer 
is the um, underfunded school district, because yeah, unfortunately your country is famous for that. And um, they are getting, um, their metric that they're interested in is um, retention of staff, basically. Yes. Good, awesome. Um, so, and how does your product strategy influence how you go about acquiring customers? So our go-to-market strategy is starting regionally. Uh, I'm located in Phoenix, Arizona. So um, I've been in education for 20 years. I have a deep network of superintendents in K-12 public schools. So we're piloting first uh, to get initial traction and leverage. And then between you know, the standard um, sales strategies. Um, one of our primary strategies is actually network effects. Um, having superintendents who are using the product early actually uh, working to identify colleagues where they want their teachers on our platform because the more teachers that we have collaborating on the platform, the better every teacher uh, does. So we're trying to leverage some network effects that are within the technology to be able to, to strategize that um, for sales. Cool. Well, we'll let someone else go now. One other example, maybe if someone else is keen. But um, so it sounds like you've got it well thought through. But um, one of the good things to do would be to, and, and it's you didn't have much time, but is to tease out as we're going through the session more about how specific, um, you know, specific to the superintendents, mm -hmm. how are you thinking about the product strategy and surfacing up the, um, the you know the measurable business outcomes from there, like the, the the almost like the analytics on how you're able to demonstrate that you can drive retention, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you give visibility into what their teachers are doing and things? Because a lot of what you talked about was a good sales strategy, but it wasn't necessarily you didn't articulate the. I'm not saying you should articulate feature function, but like where's the, you know I I think you are thinking about the value that you're delivering those folks. Mm -hmm. um, but it'd be good to see that come through a bit more. Is there one other person that wants to have a Yeah, I'd love question? to, if that's yep. all right. Sure. Uh, hi, my name's Katie. Um, and our product, uh, find, we use data to find uh, scaled corporate fraud in healthcare. Um, this is uh, stuff like kickbacks, uh, fake medical equipment deliberately sold, um, as depressing as we like. Um, what value do the customers get from the product? Uh, the customer is uh, healthcare payers, which is a parent class of like healthcare insurance. It also includes uh, we're, our, our, our go to market customer um, will, be, uh, will be small healthcare payers. Uh, basically, healthcare payers uh, will, uh, large employers, air quotes large, more than 200 employees, will amortize their own risk pool and then pay like Anthem to be. Uh, to basically for their network, but then handle their own amortization for a big discount, and they are getting defrauded a lot. So <laughs> we're making a product targeting uh, them. Um, and then how does the product strategy influence customer acquisition? This is actually one of the things I'm really here to work on. The current situation is, is that we are going to market using a branch of law called KETAM, where basically if someone defrauds the federal government, they uh, uh, so uh, employers with self-funded health plans, uh, it's no small payers is uh, legally two to um, to 50 employees. This is this is large employers and, and particularly unions in the go to market um, is that unions tend to be large enough to be self-insuring and just paying like Anthem or, or, who, or Aetna or whoever else for their provider network. Um, and so basically what happened is uh, Taft Hartley Trust. I will Google that. Um, that's not a word I know, but I'm eager to know it. Can you write that down? Thank you so much. Uh, so, so yeah. So basically, uh, and then the, the 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 way we're getting to that is uh, is where it turns out in America, if someone defrauds the government, they defrauded you, the taxpayer, and you as a wronged party can go to uh, to court and receive a percentage of the recoveries. And we're using this to work with, uh, we're beginning to work with unions and stuff that are just, they just wanna file tips. Um, yes, I would be thrilled to talk to you about that. So we're, they just wanna file tips right now. We're using this to build a partnership to eventually begin. First they, they, first they come in with us on the key jam suits and then we build towards saving them the money directly. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm, yeah. I've come to this to make that simple to explain. Uh, yeah, I um, it's a it's it's a particularly complicated space, 
uh, you've got even more um, participants, right? But I mean, in the very simple yes. thing, you're, you're basically addressing healthcare fraud for small payers, and it's going to be about providing. It's the critic, you know, the critical reason for that you're going in with is this um, threat, this litigious threat that you're committing a federal crime if you do this. And it's going to be a lot about the product functionality is going to be a lot about detecting that fraud and then having some sort of audit trail that you can. Yeah, we spend. use we use old court cases. Yes. So you can see case law to see like what is pursuable and what, well, you know, like what they do, what crime is broken, what evidence is considered valid, all of that. Yeah, um, but definitely part of the exercise here is to um, is to boil it down. So um, yes. maybe we can, we'll jump into that a bit later. But um, and I'm sure some of you have other um, less complicated markets. Sorry, um, no, that's okay. I wasn't it wasn't a criticism, <laughs> um, but it does go to show that there's you know this is one of the most important things you can do because the if you don't understand if it's actually, you know, in this case, you're selling to Anthem, right? Which is the, um, that's the person being defrauded. Uh, the, the, so, sorry. The, it's it's, it, it's not, it's not important that we go into the exact details of my yeah. company. We are selling to yeah. the, 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 sell, the self-insured groups. Yeah, self-insured groups. So anyway, so even within this sort of maelstrom of organizations, being able to identify the specific um, organization that benefits and then, you know, driving driving from that into the product strategy to understand okay well hey we we built this thing but it's actually not for that not for that group we thought we were building for that group but we actually we want to sell to that group but we built this other thing going back to the um, other example so we think with the, the education example we think we're building product features that map to the superintendent but we've actually spent all our time building features to get teachers on board with it which is really a critical first step because it doesn't work unless the teachers like it but we haven't spent enough time thinking about how do we make things visible to the superintendents so that they want to buy it beyond your initial network of connections in Arizona, right? So to scale your business, you need to go beyond selling to people you know. And, and so that's what a lot of this is about, is trying to think about the product strategy from that perspective to make sure that you are actually um, building what you think you're building and, and you know, building something that matches to what you're trying to sell. Um, and so can I just ask a quick question. Sorry, this yeah, is Leslie again. So we're B to B, but we have the potential and option to do B to C um, with a monthly subscription directly to teachers, um, which I mm -hmm. we've kind of struggled, especially in the venture space. Uh, we've been told that's very confusing <laughs> um, to be a B to B and a B to C or or pass through, however we communicate it. So I'm just curious if you think or just based on what you've, I've shared so far, obviously a bunch of our value propositions um, and our product strategies direct to the teacher. Um, you know, if, if maybe we need to leverage that sales strategy in a different way or have multiple pathways and if that's not a good idea. I think it's a good, good question to take offline. I think okay, this is sorry. another, <laughs> no, it's okay, but I'll just make the other comment, which is another pivot that education folks sometimes do is to parents as well. So you've got kind of three audiences, you've got parents, teachers, and you've got the school districts. And um, what is important is what your point is, is that aligning the thing. So making a conscious decision that if you are gonna pivot to basically being a credit card size thing where a teacher can spend, put it on her credit card and it's 20 bucks a month, and that changes your price point it changes the features it changes everything so getting that right is and then making sure that you are building the right features or vice versa if you've built a product which actually just appeals to teachers then um it might be that you want to sell it to teachers but you might also want to look at other product features that then surface that engagement because you've got a two-sided product um because it's you know so anyway let's let's take that one offline um, but it is that is the the heart of the exercise is to make sure you don't have that disconnect between like the, the people that you're actually trying to get to pay for it and the feature functions. You're always going to have some economic buyers that are different from your users, but if it's a complete mismatch, then it can be a, quite challenging. Um, um, ben, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. This is Tarane. I'm wondering how many of us might have that mismatch i'm 
I'm also in the healthcare space. And so the person that uses the product isn't necessarily the person that buys it. We've got, um, we've kind of solved for that by having essentially two products, the user version and then the employer version. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, that's kind of the nature of the industry that we're in um, requires that, frankly, that distributor pathway into the end user rather than going direct to the consumer. And so I'm, I'm wondering if that's something that the majority of other folks are, are hitting on or if we're kind of alone in that. I'd be very surprised if most people didn't have that. It's I'm not trying to say it's the wrong thing. What I'm saying is that you need to just be able to map it out and we'll get to that in a sec because it's very uncommon unless you're in the SMB space or direct to consumer it's very uncommon that your economic buyer will be exactly the same as your user um, there's not that many solutions for say I mean think about a solution for a doctor or a um, you know a person that's um, you, you're building a, a scheduling thing for for like a surgical unit the, the team that's in the surgical unit are not paying for it, but they're the ones, the nurse that, um, or the, the scheduler uh, is going to be, you know, using it is not going to be the one that's paying for it. So it's, it's super common. It's just more making sure that when you're mapping out that you are, you know, consciously being able to, there is um, a link to the value for that person as well. So we get more into it when you look at, um, if we just, I'm just, so I'm just going here. to jump in really quickly and just remind people uh, that there will be an opportunity for you to schedule one-on-one yeah. -on -one time with Ben yeah. after this session. Uh, so just keep yeah. that in mind when you're asking your questions and make sure that it's uh, relevant to the group. Yeah. So let's let's do this now. Let's spend five minutes on this. So let's get into both six and seven. So um, what's what have you got today? So start from that. And again, we've talked about products here, but there might be some folks with a more service-oriented, but like what are the product or service features? Um, who's using it and it's it's you know it's perfectly fine to have multiple constituents it's just what we want to do is not to have too many and not have like a whole bunch of constituents and then the most important ones are not ha having their you know there's nothing in the product for them basically and then what are the markets and segments that you're selling to are you trying to sell to um, SMB are you selling to the global 1000 are you selling uh, to individuals so is it a b2b to c thing so um start to jot those down if you haven't already and if you have maybe um revisit it and see if you want to add to it and then let's get straight into this as well um uh so so actually jenna what i'll do is i'll just talk through this quickly and then i'll we'll just let everyone maybe give them um five or seven minutes to do the whole thing so this next one i'll, I'll show you an example um there's an example i'll talk to the example here so what I want you to do is uh, do this for your product. So start with um, what the feature is. So, so let's say it is, if we go back to the, um, let's talk about the medical fraud one for a second. So the, the feature is the ability to identify um, kickbacks. Another feature could be um, an, a different type of fraud that's common. Um, it could be uh, another feature could be an overall roll up for an organization to look at patterns and fraud. So, uh, you know, across, you know, someone like, uh, I think you mentioned the company called Anthem, they might be looking across multiple 100 to 250 person companies and looking for patterns. So those are all different sorts of features. Who's buying that? So um, uh, in this case, uh, it could be a buyer or a user. We label it buyer there, but like it's the it's the person um, it's the person involved. Uh, the value prop. So why does that matter? So what's the actual outcome of this? So if we're talking about kickbacks, it's that, um, and this could be aspirational. You just say, look, we can uh, identify kickbacks faster and reduce them by this much. Whatever the aspirational thing is. Um, if there's a particular market, in this case, all of yours would be healthcare, um, or it might be uh, healthcare in a. It, it obviously it's it's within a, a sub segment sub, uh, sub segment of the healthcare market, and maybe it's in a particular geo. And then um, 
on the right hand side, finally, are, you know, for those of you who are working in general business, uh, mapping out are you, is it medium business, is it small business, is it enterprise? And the point of this exercise, and you'll see it here with this, this um, example, is that they're all over the place, right? So they've got various different um, personas who are using or buying the product. So you've got marketing specialists, you've got optimization specialist, you've got the director of marketing, um, you've got various value props, and then most concerningly, and, and most difficult from a go-to-market perspective, we're also seeing here that it's actually um, a mix of a bit of small business, a bit of medium, a bit of enterprise. And so you're not looking for uniformity. So I didn't catch the person's name that asked, asked if everyone maybe had this issue. So it's not an issue if you've got um, a, a buyer that's different, or so a user that's different from a buyer when we look at the personas. It's a problem if you've got six different personas and they're all different from the buyer. Um, and then you're trying to sell those across, you know, three or four different markets. So from my perspective as a marketing professional, it's very difficult to build campaigns if you're, you know, trying to sell to small, medium and enterprise and you're trying to do it across um, the US and Canada and Asia at the same time. And so mapping all this through is just a very, it's an overly simplistic approach, but it does let you um, see where you might be creating a bit of a, a challenge and, and, and a, a bit of complexity where, um, you know, we shouldn't have any. So so let's, let's just spend, um, so it's 3.35 is what my computer clock says. So why don't we um, why don't we go to like about 3.42, 3.43 and just quickly go through and um, uh, fill this out for yourselves. Um, do this if you haven't done this already. So what's on the track, who's using it, but, but this is probably a more useful thing to jump into if you haven't done this at all and see if you can map it out. So we'll come back in, a, in, in um, let's say eight minutes. In the meantime, I'll jump into the chat if anyone has any other questions. What this is saying then is that doesn't mean to say that you
everyone let's um let's get back into it so i hope everyone had a chance to sketch something down i was making a suggestion here because i was going back through looking at the comments and um apologies if i pronounce your name incorrectly but is it swati you wanted to uh jump on as an example earlier so maybe would you be prepared to volunteer and talk through this quickly what you did No, the other person I saw there that was completely different was Meredith, the kids podcast app, which yeah. I thought would be an interesting discussion if you're there, Meredith. I am. Can you hear me? I can. Do you want to talk okay. through it quickly? Um, yeah, I think absolutely. you've got quite an interesting model. Yeah, our um, product feature is a podcast app for kids um, where both kids and caregivers can safely discover um, content that's meant just for kids. Um, the buyer persona is kids and caregivers. The why is that the podcast landscape is um, massive and kids can get lost in sort of dangerous alleys of that landscape. Um, and sort of the markets that we are going live in are North American um, and English as the primary language market. So Australia, New Zealand, um, UK, et cetera. Um, and then the segment is, um, I, I don't know, I guess, <laughs> would a segment be, be SMB there or like just consumer, right? Yeah, I think it's consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's how we line up. Yeah. So that's great. So you're, when I think about that, I think about maybe the features as being ad free, parental controls, um, content discovery, because as a parent, I want to be able to also suggest to my child other things to look at because they might go down a particular rabbit hole and then you want to say hey have you seen all this cool science stuff so discovery could be a a cool thing as well yeah and discovery is um is really one of our value propositions ease of use in discovery for um yeah. for parents to give a, a tool to their kids and for them to discover safely on their own yeah so that's kind of the level i would articulate these things is ease of use um in discovery uh the parental controls because presumably there'll be some sort of parental feedback on the thing as well correct um, the parents the primary buyer the user the kid maybe in some cases if you're going after teens i guess and that might change as the age groups change so mapping that out is like you've got a younger buyer you've got a younger user persona and an older like a pre-teen or teen per persona perhaps you've got the parent um then also if you think about the future you can say well okay um there's another segment we may want to look at, not now, but later, maybe we'll look at schools and um, maybe this, maybe that's a, then that, if, if you do do that, then that 
influence is a there's a ch different channel discussion so you can see how um you could map something out and say we're just going to focus here the parent really it's parents english speaking parents in western predominantly western countries with ages of kids between this sort of this and this and so that certain features will be more important than others so maybe you know parental controls are probably more important well maybe they're important at all ages but maybe they're more important for younger ages or whatever but mapping that out and just getting a little bit more granular is super helpful yeah thank you okay cool no worries it's um yeah podcast discovery is a really hard problem as well so the other user that we didn't talk about is the content provider mm -hmm. right and um that's that's a huge problem that they're trying to just and there's a set of features around that that you'll need to think about so i should have mentioned that as well yeah so we we are um focusing on um creators in the kids space um and yeah. trying to build out um, a dashboard for them um to help yeah. find their audience as well yeah and getting that balance is tough right because now you've got multiple types of different users in terms of age you've got parents and now you've got the um content professionals so you yep. actually on a seemingly simple thing that just sits on my phone yeah. and I listen to a, a story time thing is actually a pretty complicated thing and again going back to the original question it's not about you know saying we're not going to build for that audience it's actually about it's more as you get to the right hand side of the thing and say okay well maybe we should start with where are you based seattle so maybe it's like west coast yep <laughs> as opposed to all those because there's just um a different set of uh, content creators there's a different set of um even parental styles i mean you know even across the united states so um that's something to think about as you think about those what your unique segments are okay do, let's do one other example okay let's um swati are you back no we'll, we'll do that one I, on one I, i'm here oh hi cool hello. do you want to go hello nice to meet you um nice to meet you too i think i think ours is a little bit complicated um, it's one of those Good. where the buyer persona, it, I, I, Taryn is on my team. And so I think if you're okay with it, we'd like to maybe kind of go through some of these things on a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, sure. No worries at all. No worries at all. Um, did anyone else, anyone else want to run through theirs or have any specific questions that we could cover off today? I mean, I'm, obviously we can do it, um, do it one-on-one -on -one as well. Do you think it's and possible it, of product market fit? Sorry. Yeah, no, let's go. Do again. you think it's possible of product market fit where you're still the one reaching out or should or do they have to be discovering you for you to really consider a product market fit? Oh, I, I think product market fit is an aspirational fiction that you work towards more than anything else. Okay. Um, <laughs> but like um like it's not a steady state, right? It, you you get to one level of it and then continue again we deal with companies that are a, a thousand times larger in terms of revenue and they still there's aspects of product market fit they'll still sometimes be working on so I, okay. I wouldn't I don't think there's any hard and fast there's some indicators of that in terms of you know the, the common one people will say you've got product market fit where essentially the you know if you're reaching out to companies that to or organizations it's a fairly quick conversation um uh or maybe you get a sudden if you're an inbound business which is you know a different model different go-to-market model then maybe it spikes up but i it, it's not it's not something that you just reach and then you've reached i don't think yeah I, I didn't mean to say it was final <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um so we could we could pick that one up if you've got specific questions around that uh, of course, you'll always want to be telling investors that you're close to it. I, that was my, as a as entrepreneurs, um, you know, keep working towards it, but don't beat yourselves up if you're not exactly there. It's all it's a relative question. Um, so that that was more of a trick question, that first one there. Um, so this is just really about getting a sense of, like, the style of your market movement at the moment. Like, 
uh, are you having to like do a lot of education? Um, I mean, that second one, I'd be very surprised if many people were in the second situation where customers are pulling for the solution. Um, that doesn't happen that often. Like it's it's always almost always harder than that. Um, the third bullet here to think about, make some notes on. This is really just about going back to like if you're looking at um, the the right hand side here, if you're seeing a lot of different segments and a lot of confusion, then that's the thing to you know to think about, and that's what really that's getting at. Um, so this is just more about like trying to gauge where you are, understanding that as I said on all these things, whether it's product market fit or something else, it's a it's more of an ongoing thing. It's not a you don't just reach it and it happens. Um, I see we okay. have one hand in the chat. Meg Diaz, do you have a question? Oh yeah, I was just um, more looking at. Um you know, our fit and, you know, we're a little different in being a direct consumer um, company with, um, we're piloting now um, and sorting out sort of um, channel, especially. Um, What's the product? It's lipstick. Cool. So it's basically green lipstick. Um, it's been sort of re with unusual packaging, um, smaller diameter, um, green formula, compostable packaging, um, an applicator based on sort of Renaissance art, actually not sort of, based on Renaissance art tools that makes it easier to apply and targeting women over 40. And what's the, um, what do you think is different? Like in terms of what, what's, what are you struggling with a bit here or? We're, um, we actually, we think we have a potential for pretty good disruption, given that our research indicates a lot of the traditional format of acquiring beauty products doesn't work for women. And there is a fair amount of concern about both formula and packaging. Mm -hmm. And it's still a crowded market that's difficult to push into. Um, so it's sort of funny to look and say, we have a, we're fairly confident we have a fit and we have a, we've gotten enough response to know we have a product people like and getting in that market um, without, you know, on a, as a startup is, has been, you know, is challenging. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the distribution is very difficult, right? Getting in that. Are, are you going for a retail we're actually hoping to avoid going into retail unless we use it for exposure, you know, sort of events exposure to raise our profile for brand building. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, everything just yeah, I mean, a, a part of the product too is that, so there's three parts to it in my mind. There's one is the buyer experience, like discovery and buying it and finding it. And that's, almost as an important product feature is the product itself so you know making sure that if you're selling online direct to consumer that it's um it's you know it's very straightforward like you, you're really thinking about that online experience as well and how then someone that's going to be a champion because you're going to be it's almost a there's an element of cause to your product cause-based marketing yeah. because once you once i'm using the product i want to tell other people because I think the values are great. I want to tell other people about it. So making it incredibly, that a great, it's almost like that's a product feature too. It's like how people share um, the, you know, and they're, they're proud about the brand, how they share that. So there's all that digital stuff. Then you've got the actual product and there's the physical design aspects of it and the packaging. And presumably you've got some offsets and things going on for your schedule see whatever it is emissions and all that sort of stuff as well right so you've got compostable packaging and all that sort of thing but you're thinking about the supply chain as well i'm sure yeah um, yeah we're working with like a carbon neutral printer and things like that yeah things like that uh and so all of these things that we're talking about uh like that's a feature carbon neutral printing is a feature in this case right um and then what's going to be interesting i think is to you'll probably start off direct to consumer build a bit of a brand that way and then you'll get some leverage to be able to go into certain retail stores 
uh, there's some interesting partnerships you might think about. So there's more and more conscious consumer products coming out. Like there's one actually out of New Zealand called Kogo. It's in the UK and New Zealand. And they're all about shifting spend from bad to good. So, you know, it's the whole consumer um, advocacy thing. And so there may be distribution partners that you want to consider as a persona here as well, that you think about that are not necessarily makeup retailers, but in the green space and that they've got an audience because a lot of this is around distribution and reach, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very, the making the lipstick was probably the easy bit, um, unfortunately. Yeah. So very cool. Um, I'm not directly in the market myself, but I will look out for it. Sounds like a good gifting idea. I'm not in your demographic, but I'd love a link. It sounds really cool. Okay. Yeah, pop a link in the in the chat so we can all check it out. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes. So um, this was a, in hindsight, Jen, I'm sorry, we should have made this 90 minutes. Um, but the good news is, I'm happy to try and accommodate as many people as possible. And if I have to schedule more time uh, because I can't get to everyone, then we'll do that as well because I'm always happy to have a chat. Um, there's Jenna's email. There's my email. I don't look like that anymore. I don't have any hair left. I don't wear suits. Um, yeah, so hopefully I will talk to some of you next week. Uh, Feel free, if you want to just do it asynchronously on email, feel free just to mail me directly. For those of you who are watching this at home uh, later, you may have missed out already. So next time, Graham and Walker offer something live, try and make it live. But I will do my best to try and accommodate you as well. So um, anything else, um, Jen, at this stage? Yes, well, first of all, thank you so much for this workshop and thank you to everyone who participated. It was really great to see um, how active you all were. I hope this was a useful session for you. Um, I just put the link to sign up for office hours with Ben in the chat and we'll also be sending up or sending out a follow up email uh, with the recording of the session as well as that link. And then I also, of course, just want to plug some upcoming events for Grandma and Walker. We have a fireside chant chat with Amanda Getz. I just put that in the chat on June 16th. And then we actually have a part two for this session uh, with Connor Ross, who was here earlier, uh, who's talking about iteration and experimentation. So you're talking about product market fit earlier. This is the workshop to go to, and that will be on June 28th. So I think that is all. Thank you again so much for coming, and we'll be in touch shortly. Have a great uh, rest of your day, everyone. Ciao.